Golu Vasum, Gulingambi sa Weker Hordolva, at her ye fathers en anar Gaelar, Firioth Nathan sor Trouther Honey at Solum Hailyar. Ger nu gamer mio, Firni pa Haley Feister Moonslit nine frecky Reynar, Fjold wet ek fruda, from so ek lengra um Ragnar Rock, rum Sigtiwa. In March of the year 860, your army of 5,000, led by the brothers Askold and Deer, was being sent south by Rurik of Latoga to restore order in the southern reaches of the Slavic lands. Between you and the south were lands belonging to the allied tribes, but also to the tribes not so keen of the union between your people and theirs. Even further south, the land of the Khazars, and beyond that, the fabled Miklagard. The territory you passed through first belonged to the Kravici. Your guides had explained to you how they were named after their ancient forefather, Kriv, and that their name meant blood relationship, implying the meaning in your language of blood kin. You passed through several farming villages, including one where you were able to see a gathering with your own eyes. Their culture was very traditional to your sphere standards. One of the guides explained that their view was that the gods created the world once and for all time, and that no new laws should modify the way of life passed down to them by Kriv, the forefather. You had spent most of your time with the skins and had grown even closer, your group one of several responsible for hunting and foraging for the army. An army which bartered and purchased much of what it needed from the villages, like these ones, on the route south but hunting and foraging also played a big part. Revna, the wolfskin with the raven feathers, was a pupil of all things that grew in the wild. She could differentiate the mushrooms of nourishment from those of visions and those of certain instant or lingering death. While you were an able hunter and could forage for basics, you could previously identify perhaps one or two edible mushrooms at most, and thus learned a lot from her and from the others. Revna's wearing of feathers, these weeks later, now made more sense as well. You'd heard from the others that Revna could fight like a she-wolf when required, but preferred stealth, likening herself exactly to an opportunistic raven. This was the source of something else you learned about her, her nickname of Odin's Raven, which the others had affectionately dubbed her with. During your last day in the territory of the Kravici, you joined several hunting parties in a celebration of your trip south to restore trade and order. It also afforded you a glimpse into their religion. They believed in a forest spirit called the Leshi, the Leshi who assigned and portioned out prey to hunters. You found this odd. Njorn was your god of the wind and sea and hunting, and while fate was itself shaped by the Norn, and an important part of your people's beliefs to you, it seemed your gods would not interfere in such matters, preferring instead the fate of armies and entire regions of people to whether you were fated to catch a deer or not. Other gods were similar to your own. Peron was much like Thor as the Slavic god of the sky, thunder, and war. However, among your people, Thor's hammer Mjolnir was often worn by men and women alike for protection. Among the common Slavic people you came across that were equivalent in station to you, there was no such similar symbols. In fact, it was mostly only the chiefs and rulers who would follow him. Then there was Strybog, the god of the winds and of weather, from soft rain to raging storms. He was said to be the ancestor of the winds of the eight directions. He was the connector of the heavens and the earth, and according to the guides, while he was a brave and fearless warrior, he was said to be often angry and short-tempered. For the Slavic farmers, though, he was the most important god, as he brought rain for the crops. For you, the most interesting was Svarog, whose son was the sun deity. Svarog was the god of blacksmiths and of celestial fire. You knew well that the secret of steel was stolen from the dwarves by Loki and dropped where you men found it. The Slavs, however, believed that the smiths 
prongs fell from the sky, which of course did not address where the secret of steel itself came from in the first place. Either way, their techniques of smithing were much as yours. In fact, for generations, trade and exchange smithing knowledge between your two peoples took place. Your time with Revna and among the Slavic tribes awakened a thirst for knowledge within you. While you were not quite ready to give up an eye for it, or hang yourself on Uktrasil, but here, far from home, you began to absorb everything you could. The skins you'd assumed were merely berserker in battle. But you were wrong. Much of what they did was stealth-based. They were trained to survive off the land and scout ahead often for days. Each day, you were learning more. For starting fires, you would often use flint and steel with either birch or ash bark. However, they showed you how to also start fire with quartz stones, and failing the ability to find the right type of stone, simply two sticks. They also always kept a fungus you learned to identify that they then soaked in urine and stressed to you while weapons were important. This would be your most important tool to stay alive when living off the land. We have gotten soft in our houses, Nyalandaga would say. The journey overland soon fell into predictable cycles. You and the other skin groups would scout with the guides the best overland route for the ships to the next portion of navigable river. The thralls acted as log bearers. They would place each log in front of the ship and the rest would push the boat along. Each time a ship passed over a log, it was returned to the front, and so on. With a coordinated group, ships could be moved overland, not as fast as a marching army, of course, but much faster than any enemy would expect. The going was through forested lands with occasional clearings in the form of meadows. Your trip had wound south and east and even west at times. After many weeks, you were on the river the locals called Dnieper, meaning river on the far side, which your Krivich guides indicated fed into the land on one side of the Dregovich and on the other side, the eastern Polans tribe. The area was under the rule of the Khazar, a people that, according to the guides, did not settle here until recent times, having previously lived via horses and moved from place to place around the eastern and northern reaches of the lands of the Greeks. From there, they had grown their lands westward and even northward to the destination you were headed. Their capital was called Attil and it was located far to the east, even further east than the eastern shores of the Great Sea north of Miklagard. After some sixty days, you were still at least a week out from the town. Askold and Dürr sent the skins to scout the land surrounding the town and the town itself for information. Your group, with a few dozen others, including the guides, were tasked with entering the town. You posed as traders, bringing in furs, to trade with the local population. The various groups traveled mostly at night to not alarm them. The town itself sat on the western bank of the river atop a hill of some 125 meters. The brothers Njal and Aga roamed the traveler locations, Trolls and Arne, the smaller villages surrounding the town, and you and Revna, the places of commerce. In a traveler's lodge, you were told by the locals that the Khazars were exerting higher and higher taxation. The reason? Pressure on their southwestern borders from a nomadic tribe by the name of the Pechenegs. The Pechenegs, they said, controlled increasingly larger tracts of land around the large sea that led to Miklagard. One thing was clear, and it shone brighter than the conflict between the Khazar and the Slavic townsfolk who were paying them fealty. Miklagard's influence. The coins you'd rarely seen as a child were everywhere here, as were luxuries you could not have in your wildest imaginings conceived of. All of you noticed it. The clothing, the food, the pottery, the metalware, and the glassware. The latter, carried by a man of the Christian cross, calling himself Cyril. He was from Miklagard, sent to convert others to his cross. He stood in the midst of the town's main square, holding what you would learn was a fibrous wonder upon which words could be written, much like the runestones of home, only this could be carried and stored much easier. 
He was holding this while speaking to a small group of locals who seemed to be paying more attention to the material goods he carried and the possibilities of trade than word of his cross. You'd seen glass, but nothing approaching this quality, and certainly not in shape or material, for he carried a glass wine jug that you could peer clear through. It was clear that, though taxation increased, the Khazar men carrying out the enforcement had not. Perhaps a thousand of the men were in the vicinity of the town and the villages, with roughly half garrisoned in the town itself. With the intelligence gathered and the assigned two days to scout over, the various groups made their way back to the main hidden camp. Askold and Deer asked for you personally. You were led into their tent. It was told to me that you saw a man of the cross in the town. Tell me about him. You told Askold that he was said to come from Miklagard and of the strange glass you saw. Askold's eyes glimmered and he turned to speak to his brother. Deer, we take the town as you suggested. We need the man of the cross alive. I want to question him. He turned back towards you and addressed you again. Your group will leave again tonight. Get close to this man of the cross. Learn his places of visit. We will attack the town in four days as evening falls. The townsfolk leader will send the signal. Ensure when we do, this man of the cross is captured for us to speak to. That night, your group questioned you about your conversation with Askold and Deer. You told them of the conversation and the plans for the next few days. Njal spoke up. Then it is time for much drink and revelry, for we do not know what the next few days will bring. So that night, you, Njal, Aga, Revna, Trolls, and Arna laughed and drank. It was good to have comrades, a group of misfits like yourself, and hoped it would last in the days and weeks to come. The plan was for the other advanced groups of skins to sabotage as many horses as they could before the signal. They would remove saddles and equipment from the horses to ensure time was on your and the local townspeople's side. Part of your army would also ensure that the town would have no escape. Escape that could alert others from nearby garrisons. The rest would, along with the townspeople, attack the Khazars once the signal was provided. Your group entered the town that first day in the morning, and you set about each shadowing the Man of the Cross. His routines were consistently unpredictable during the day. He seemed to go wherever whim and fancy took him, almost by the hour. An interesting conversation with an elder or merchant continued sometimes for hours. His charisma was undeniable, and he seemed to be able to overcome most any objection. The only consistency was his penchant for nightly drink, which tended to start in the late afternoon and continued well into the evening. If he was charismatic during the day, he was a veritable scald by night, attracting large crowds that only grew as he got more inebriated and animated. Now what he spoke of you had no clue, but whatever it was brought looks of awe, surprise, and even glee to most of those he spoke to, unlike the crowds he spoke to during the day. The night of the planned attack, Revna kept an eye out for the townsman responsible for the signal. You had met with him the previous day, and he was to start an accidental hay fire at one of the higher visible points atop the hillside. You were in the tavern with the rest of the group watching the now familiar routine of the man when cries began to ring out among the Khazars in their strange tongue. Your people had initiated their attack. There would be no pillaging of goods or slaughter of townsfolk provided they stuck to the accord struck with Askold and Deer. The common enemy were the Khazars and they would not be spared. You released Fenrir your hammer from the straps of your back as a group of six Khazars that had been seated at the far side of the room raised themselves from their table with their weapons drawn and approached. The weapons were swords about as long as yours but with a slight curve to them. They wore red and purple tunics and although it had been a while for the familiar feeling of combat, excitement, it overcame you and your vision narrowed, focused on the Khazar that approached you. He appeared your age and swung his sword at you in a way that was unfamiliar, but you were able to block with Fenrir, catching the blade in the inner angle of your hammer blade. 
You turned the hammer as you had so often trained, bringing Fenrir's towards the man's belly. He was strong, but no match for your strength honed via years of farming and blacksmithing. You pushed Fenrir down and into the man's belly with the tooth side, tearing it along his length. The look of shock overcame the man as he looked down to see his own entrails sticking out of the fresh wound. You then mercifully took the blunt edge of Fenrir and collapsed the man's head on his left side, which caused his eyes to freeze in that shocked look and him to crash lifeless into the table. As you turned, a blade bit deep into your left shoulder and you staggered backwards, losing your grip on Fenrir, which fell near the feet of the man you had just slain. This Khazar, a full head taller than you, continued his advance, seeing his opportunity of you now prone and weaponless, and he lunged forward with his weapon aimed at your chest. As he lunged, though, he barked in pain, turning towards the source. There, Revna stood, with her dagger now protruding from the back of the man. You reached for Fenrir, just as Revna thrust a second dagger into the man's midsection. He lashed out at her with the hilt of his sword, striking her jaw and collapsing her to the floor. With Fenrir now firmly in your grasp, you brought its teeth down the man's back next to the dagger and then spun round bringing Fenrir up high and ending any further opposition. You helped a clearly dazed Revna to her feet just as the sounds of combat from the others ebbed. With the battle won, you looked around in panic as the man you were to keep an eye on was no longer present. You sprinted out of the tavern, seeing him in the distance, clearly walking under the influence of drink, trying to stagger away towards what you knew was the wealthier part of town. You were able to catch up to him and bring him back to the others, despite constant protestations, none of which you understood. You tied the man, and your group attempted to make its way through the fighting in the town toward Askold and Deir as planned. The Khazars were not finished fighting, however, and you soon found yourself outnumbered and surrounded. <laughs>